Hey, Northfield families, nothing beats gathering together in person, but what an incredible opportunity we have to gather just like this right here from your very own home. And so thank you for allowing us to be a part of your week, even though it's different than our norm right here and right now. Hey, you still have an opportunity to do good right there from your couch. All you've got to do is check in on Facebook or Instagram that you're watching this morning because it still counts even though we're at home because we still do good in the world because that's what we're about. We're love God, love people, and make Jesus known. So if you want to check in on Facebook or Instagram, you can help support Souls for Souls all this first quarter of the year just by checking in and doing good. After you're done checking in, we would love for you to fill out what we call our digital connection card. You've been around before, you know what this is like, but that digital connection card is an on-ramp to several avenues to community, to service and ministry right here at Northfield Church. And one of the incredible opportunities that we have for you to serve really for the next year is in our first impressions department, whether that's greeting, security, in the parking lot. We have a number of opportunities for you because as you have seen, our campus is starting to grow and take a new life and new shape. And so because of that, we're gonna have some wayfinding help that we need from you. And so if you're interested and you're that hospitable type, we would love for you to sign up on that digital connection card that you can help in either greeting, parking, security, first impressions, we need you. So fill out that digital connection card. And if you've got some ways that we can pray for you as an individual or you as a family, we would be honored to do so. And our staff will gather in this next week to pray specifically for you. Again, we're thankful for this opportunity that we have to gather in an unconventional way. And we can't wait to gather in person, but for now, let's enjoy this time that we have together. Good morning, Northfield family. I hope you guys are at home and warm and bundled up with your family and enjoying God's creation. As I was out just enjoying the snow this week, I just kept having this verse that came to my mind and it was Psalm 8. And it says, when I consider the works of your hands, the moon, the stars, and all that you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? Human beings that you care for them. And that verse ends by saying, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Reveal yourself to me. 
So let me ask you a question. How do you typically do when life stops? I'll answer for me first, and it's not well, okay? I'll be honest with you. For about 24 hours when the snow came through our area, it was beautiful. It was majestic. It was all of the wonder that you want out of a snow day. But then, then it started to be an inconvenience. Then it started to creep up on me of all of the ways that this snow was robbing me of what I felt like I was doing. It was at this point that I realized that the work and the life rhythm was gone. And those of you who have young children in your house, this resonates with you especially because you know what happens in your house when the rhythm and the routine is gone. So how do you typically respond You'd think with a few years of experience in this, we would know how to handle life when it stops. But yet, sometimes we find ourselves thinking more of us than we do what's going on around us. And if we're not careful, when our work and our life rhythm stops, well, we become guilty of thinking that we were the ones that kept the world spinning in the first place. If we go back to Genesis chapter 1, we find something incredible And it is that we were not the ones that created the heavens and the earth. That we were not the ones that hung the moon and the stars into place. We were not the ones that inhabited the earth with its beauty and its majesty. No, you see, we were created, not creator. And because we were created, it means that we were created for a purpose. We were created for work and we were created for delight in this life. And I love that in the message version of Genesis chapter 2 and verse 1, it says this, that heaven and earth were finished down to the last detail. And by the seventh day, God had finished his work. And on the seventh day, he rested from all of his work and God blessed the seventh day and he made it a holy day because on that day, he rested from all of the creating that he had done. You see, this was the story of how it all started, of how heaven and earth were created. You see, it's not because of the 60-hour week that we want to put in this week that is going to keep the world turning. You see, that job has already been fulfilled on our behalf. So, for you, for us, as we are maybe on the, the dwindling down of this time we have together at home, Maybe to introduce you to a new thought of this time at home. Maybe instead of it being an inconvenience to the the rhythm and the routine that you thrive under, maybe take it as an opportunity to model your creator, to model what it looks like to rest and delight in those around you, to rest and to delight in the beauty and the majesty that this world has to offer us. So as we take communion together, Maybe I want to give you a new thought as we close down this dismissal of our rhythms and routines. That maybe as we fire back in to the kids going to school tomorrow, that we have one last moment of recognizing and realizing that the rest and the delight that God has offered us, well, it pours into this moment of communion. That that you and your living rooms together gathered with the people that you love so dearly, well, it's this reminder that there was a very communal nature to our relationship with our Heavenly Father, to Jesus' relationship with His disciples, and, well, that same love that He has for us. And so I want to invite you, if you have these items readily available in your home, we would love to take communion with you. But those of you that may not be prepared or have them, well, we'd love for you to join this moment with us. And maybe even reflect and delight on the ways that God has richly blessed you and your family in this time that you've spent together at home. So if you haven't, I want to invite you to take the bread and to eat it. And take the cup and to drink it. And know that when we do this, well, we reflect on the goodness of our Heavenly Father. That He would send His Son into this world, He would enter into our mess, 
He would show us a new way of life and that we would turn around and follow him with everything that we have. Acts 17.25 says he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives life and breath and everything else. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. Great are you. No. 
nothing else fit for a king except for a heart singing hallelujah hallelujah it's your breath in my lungs so we pour out our praise pour out Don't you love that song? You know, I never get tired of hearing how God gives life and how he brings light to the darkness. And in fact, that's really what I want to talk about today. How do you, how do you hear from God and how do you know maybe when it's his voice you're listening for? Before we dive in, I, I do hope that your family is warm and they're safe and that you're enjoying this time away. But there's nothing like being together in person and with God's family. But on those rare occasions when we can't, I'm so thankful that we have this medium that we can be together and uh, that we can talk about God's Word. You know, as we kicked off 2024, we gave you a challenge. And the challenge was this, to be in God's Word every day, uh, at least four days a week anyway. Uh, we gave you a... Uh, uh, a chart that kind of outlines some scriptures and some prayers that you could pray for night to shine as we approach February the 9th. And I hope you're getting ready for that. Uh, but after February the 9th, we're going to lay out an additional Bible reading plan for you this year because there's something about being in the Word. And if you were here for that message a few weeks ago, you'll understand and you'll remember the chart that we gave that talked about the benefit of being in God's Word. So if you haven't started that, I hope that you will do so today. And if you are uh, uh, moving right along uh, with, the, with the plan, I, I want to thank you and I want to encourage you to continue to do so. As we sang, it is God who gives life, and it's God who gives life. And knowing that, well, it makes it so much more important for us to know Him. And one of the biggest ways that we know God is through His Word that He has given us. Uh, Peter tells us that His Word gives us everything that pertains to life and to godliness. And the Word of God, well, it's not like reading any other book. The writer of Hebrews tells us that the Word of God is alive and it's active. And what that means is this, the Word of God has the power to change your life. You know, Satan, uh, he's our enemy. We have an enemy. He doesn't want you to believe that. He doesn't want you to believe that the Word of God can change your life. So he will do everything he can to keep you out of it because he knows that it's alive. He knows it's active. He knows it has the power to change your life. And he knows that the Word of God can actually drive the enemy out of your life. Because of that, he's going to do everything within his power to keep you out of God's Word. The enemy would like to convince you that there are only certain people that God speaks to through His Word. The enemy would like to convince you that maybe only the priest or the pastor or maybe a, an elder or a deacon, that those are the ones who can hear from God. Or maybe it's the Sunday school teacher or the people who work at the church building, that those are the people who hear from God. Maybe he's convinced you that, uh, that it's that TV preacher that could hear from God or you have to have some religious degree. And maybe he's even whispered in your ear that, uh, well, I, I, I mean, I'm none of that, so, so I can't hear from him. He may have whispered in your ear as well that you've done too much, you've gone too far for God to speak to you today. But every one of those thoughts are lies from the enemy. And I want you to know that you can have a relationship with God, a relationship where you know Him, where He knows you, and where He speaks to you through His Word. You can have a relationship with God, the kind of relationship where, where you can open His Word and you can dive into His Word and you can have the Holy Spirit speak to you and give you guidance and comfort and direction in your life. And if the enemy 
Well, if he can convince you to chuck this book aside, if he can convince you that maybe other people benefit from it from not you, then he has you and he has me at a disadvantage. Because what happens is when we stop listening to, to God's word, we start listening to other people's word. And God wants you and God wants me listening for his voice. So in our time that we have this morning together, I, I hope you've got the kids with you. I hope you've got your, your husband, your wife with you. If you're single, I hope you've gathered around and maybe you're taking notes because uh, I've really just got three big things to say to us today. Uh, how do we do that? How do we position ourselves to hear from God? The first idea I have is this. Uh, ask yourself, where's my quiet place? Where's my quiet place? You remember that cell phone commercial that uh, I think it was several years ago because it's been a while since I've seen it, but the guy has his cell phone and he's walking around and he's pointing it up and he's pointing it down and he's saying, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Walking around in the air trying to get some voice. Well, in my life, I've discovered that the the noise around me and the, the pollution of hearing so many other voices and the busyness Well, it can often drown out the Word of God to where I have trouble hearing Him now. To hear from Him, I need that quiet space. And I believe that you need that quiet space. Psalm 46 was a powerful psalm to the Jewish people. It starts off by saying that God is our strength and He is our refuge. He is an ever-present help in time of trouble. He goes on to say that because God is on my side, he says, I'm not going to fear even if the earth were swept away or the mountains would be moved into the sea. And he goes on to say that the nations are in an uproar. And all you have to do is turn on the evening news to see that, well, all the nations, they're in an uproar. So in the midst of God saying all of those things, that I'm your strength, I'm your power, that I'm not going to fear no matter what happens, that even though the nations around me may be in an uproar, what do you think God's remedy is for that? Well, if you look to Psalm 46, verse 10, the psalmist says, after after saying all of those things, he gives us an admonition. He says, instead of running around, instead of worrying, instead of struggling, he says, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. You see, it's one thing to know that God can be a help and that he, He can be a comfort. It's another thing to dive into His Word and to wait on an answer from Him. Because often I get upset and I get frustrated and and I get busy going here and there and trying to work out my own problems or the solutions that I may need. And God says, Tom, if you want to hear from me, would you position yourself in that place where you can actually hear what I'm saying to you? James If you remember James, he's the half-brother of Jesus. And uh, uh, James started out by not believing in Jesus. And then all of a sudden, after the resurrection, he believes in Jesus and even gives his life for Jesus. Well, he writes one of the books that are recorded for us uh, in in what we call the Bible. And the half-brother of Jesus in James 1.19, he says these words. He says, let every one of you be quick to listen and slow to speak. Quick to listen. To hear from God, I need to be listening for God. Well, that's hard for me to do often with the noise of the world around me. And often I find that I need to find that quiet place by myself. I often try to come up with 50 ways to solve what's in front of me. And often it's only when I get to the end of my rope that I turn to God and I say, God, what would you have me do? And often it's in that place that I go. It's, it's my safe place, my quiet place, where I go and get still and listen for what he has to say. The second thing uh, uh, that I would encourage you to write down about your time in the Word for God is this. Expect to hear from him. Expect to hear from God. Anticipate that God is going to talk to you. A.W. Tozer, he once wrote these words, The person who does not expect to hear from God... He won't. He won't hear from God. Often God will will give us an answer and uh, if we're not expecting to hear from God, you know, we'll chalk it up to coincidence. We'll we'll say, well, I certainly got lucky that time, didn't I? Or something good will happen and we'll thank our lucky stars and wow, I was in the right place. But when you get in your quiet place, before you even open the word to bow your head to your father and ask him to speak to you, Ask Father to give you guidance. 
and give you direction. Listen to his promise from John chapter 10, verse 10. Jesus said these words, My sheep know my voice. It seems like such a simple statement, but it is powerful. Let me read it again to you and listen uh, intently. My sheep know my voice. Again, it is a lie of the enemy to get you to think that you need to be something other than what you are to hear from God. God says your past doesn't qualify you from hearing from me. God says you don't have to be the prophet, the priest, or the king. He says all you have to do is be one of his sheep, to be one of his flock, to be a son or daughter of God. And he says, guess what? You can hear from me. So I would say this, pray that God would take away any thought or any idea that you have in your head that you want to hear from Him and begin to speak into the situations of your life and ask God to speak and ask Him for direction, anticipating that He will listen and He will hear. And then my last thought from being in the Word on this uh, uh, on this day is it really comes from that same chapter, John chapter 10, but we're going to move down to verse, I mean, John chapter 14, and we're going to move down to verse 27, where John, again, John is the best friend of Jesus. So he got to know Jesus very well in his life. And John records the words of Jesus as this. He says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I find my quiet place to be alone with God. I pray and expect and anticipate for him that he's going to speak to me as I read his word. And number three from that verse, I have predecided to follow the voice of my shepherd. I have predecided to listen to him. It's not mystical, it's not a secret. It's not even like I have to have the whole thing figured out because I don't. I simply have to say, but it often takes great faith to listen to his voice, which means I predecided to follow because anywhere in Scripture where it tells us to listen, the implication is that we're going to listen because we're going to follow. And sometimes, well, sometimes he's going to tell me to stop doing something, and, and usually it's something that I know that I already need to stop doing. And other times, well, he may tell me to start doing something, something that I've been putting off doing. You know, Mother Teresa once said these words uh, to someone who was struggling with what to do in their spiritual walk. And she looked and she said, the next kind thing that you find to do, just do it. Whatever it is, the next kind opportunity that God brings your way, just decide to do it. Maybe something uh, like finding that quiet place, praying and anticipating that God is going to speak to me as I open His Word, and predeciding to follow His voice no matter where that leads us. I love Joshua chapter 1 from the message. Uh, Moses, if you remember, Moses has just died. Joshua is now taking over and leading God's people. And in Joshua chapter 1, you find that God comes to Moses, I mean to Joshua, and he gives them this incredible charge on how to lead the people into Israel. He's telling Joshua how the people of Israel are going to be blessed in this new life and in this new land that God is giving them. It comes from Joshua chapter 1. Listen to these words. Joshua, Moses my servant is dead. Get going. Cross the Jordan River, you and all the people. Cross to the country. I'm giving to the people of Israel. I'm giving you every square inch of the land that I promised on, that just as I promised Moses. I won't leave you. Be strong and courageous. You are going to lead this people to inherit the land that I promised to give their ancestors. So you give it everything you have, heart, mind, and soul. And then he says these words. Make sure you carry out, and here's our challenge, make sure you carry out every word of God that Moses gave you. Every bit of it. Don't get off track, either left or right. Make sure you get to where you're going. And don't for a minute let the book of Revelation be out of your mind. Ponder and meditate on it day and night, making sure you practice what's in it. Then you'll succeed. Then you'll get to where I'm going. Haven't I commanded you, Joshua, be strong and courageous. Don't be determined. Don't be timid. 
Don't get discouraged. God, your God, will go with you every step of the way. You know, by the time you get to the pages of the New Testament, Jesus said the same thing. He ends the Sermon on the Mount with these words. Whoever hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. You see, it's not only hearing and anticipating that God's going to do something great in your life. It's then taking that final step and following or listening, putting these words into practice. Well, Jesus says, well, that man is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. He says, the the rains came down, the winds blew, and it beat against that house, but that house stood because its foundation was on a rock. What you need to know today is this book is alive. Do you believe that? The Hebrew writer tells us that it's living, it's active, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's not just black, white, and if you've got a red letter edition, red ink on a page, it's not just 66 books, poems, and, and letters. This is the only book on the planet where you can read a passage and God's Spirit will speak to you. This is the only book that I know that you can read and anticipate and have God speak to a particular situation in your life that you have struggled with. There's only one book that can do that. It's this book. It is your assurance that though Satan form an enemy against you in 2024, that enemy will not prosper. It is this book that tells you that you have been adopted into God's family and you are his child. It is this book that lets you know that you are not rejected, that you are handpicked, chosen by God above. It is this book that lets you know that he will not only give you, but lavish on you the grace and the riches of heaven. It is the Word of God that lets you know that you've been completely forgiven. And it is the Word of God that tells you that despite your past, your failings, or your successes, that you are loved with an everlasting love. So my prayer for you is that, one, you would find that quiet place. That when you find it, that you would go and and before you open the pages, that you would pray and that you would expect and anticipate and ask God to, to reveal himself to you through those pages. Expect that he will speak to you. And then, whatever he says, predetermine that you're going to do it. And like Joshua of old, I think God will say, you will find success in wherever you go. Or like the words of Jesus, That's like building your house on a sure foundation, a rock that can't be taken away. Could I pray with you? Father, uh, I thank you. I pray a simple prayer for all of us today. Father, I pray that you would help us find that quiet place in our lives. That when we get there, Father, that, that we would anticipate that you are going to show up. And that, Father, as we open the pages of your word and your Holy Spirit leads us and guides us, that that we would not only anticipate, but that we would, in fact, hear from you. And I pray, Father, Father, that all of those things that we hear, that we will have pre-decided in our minds that we are going to follow your voice, our shepherd. Thank you so much. And all of us, in the name of Jesus, said, Amen. Thank you for joining us today, and I look forward to seeing you next week in person.